Ever wonder what everything around us is made of? Why, particles, of course. Imagine if we could shrink down, smaller than the smallest microscope allows, right down to where we could see individual particles. If we could do that, we'd see that everything around us, every object, every substance, every single thing is a party of particles just hanging out together. In fact, the air we breathe, the water we drink, the food we eat, and even we ourselves are composed of these tiny particles. They're so small we can't see them with our naked eyes. But they're there, and they're constantly in motion, interacting with each other, and forming the basis of the world as we know it. Now let's dive a bit deeper. What happens when these particles decide to throw different kinds of parties? Well, we get what we call pure substances and mixtures. Pure substances are like exclusive parties. Only one type of particle is invited. It could be an element where each particle is an atom of the same type, or a compound where different atoms join together in a specific way to form particles of the same type. On the other hand, mixtures are like open parties. They're less picky, inviting different types of particles to mingle together. And the great thing is, no matter how much they mix and mingle, each particle retains its original properties. So, in a nutshell, the particle theory of matter tells us that everything is made up of tiny particles, which can either stick to their own kind in pure substances, or hang out with others in mixtures. But remember, it's not just a theory, it's a fact. Scientists have proven it over and over again. And it's this understanding that helps us make sense of the world around us, from the air we breathe to the food we eat, to the water we drink, and even the stars in the sky. So remember, every single thing around us is a party of particles. Now let's dive deeper into the world of pure substances and mixtures. It's not as clear-cut as it sounds. So buckle up as we get down to the nitty-gritty of particles. We already had our exclusive party example, but you can also think about a pure substance as a solo artist, belting out notes on their own. A pure substance is made up of only one type of particle. It could be an element like our friend oxygen, chilling all by itself, or a compound like water where two hydrogens and one oxygen have decided to form a band. Now, mixtures are like a music festival where different artists come together. They're made up of two or more different types of particles, but unlike our band of water, these particles are not chemically bonded together, they are just hanging out in the same space. A bowl of fruit salad, for instance, is a mixture, strawberries, apples, and oranges all together, but each retaining their individual characteristics. Here's where our handy-dandy particle theory comes into play. It helps us distinguish between pure substances and mixtures. For example, if we zoom into a pure substance like gold, we'll find that each particle is identical, like a choir hitting the same note. But if we zoom into a mixture like air, we'll find different particles, nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide, and others, each playing their own tune. But remember, just like music genres, not all mixtures are the same. We have homogeneous mixtures, where the particles are evenly distributed, like a perfectly blended smoothie. And then there are heterogeneous mixtures, where the particles are not evenly distributed like a rocky road ice cream. But hey, we'll get more into that in our next scene. So pure substances and mixtures are like the solos and the bands of the particle world respectively. They each have their own unique compositions and characteristics, and together they make up the wonderful and diverse world of matter. Stay tuned for the next scene where we will rock out with homogeneous and heterogeneous mixtures, Ever heard of homogeneous and heterogeneous mixtures? Let's find out what these fancy words mean. A homogeneous mixture is like a well-blended smoothie. You've got all your favorite fruits in there, maybe some yogurt or a dash of honey, all whirred together into a delicious, consistent blend. You can't pick out the individual ingredients because they're uniformly distributed. In scientific terms, a homogeneous mixture is one where the components that make up the mixture are uniformly distributed throughout the mixture. The composition is the same throughout, and you can't distinguish between different parts of the mixture. So, when you're sipping on that smoothie, you're enjoying a homogeneous mixture. Now let's switch gears and talk about a heterogeneous mixture. Picture a bowl of trail mix. You see raisins, nuts, bits of chocolate, maybe some dried fruit. Each ingredient maintains its own properties and can be separated from the mixture. Unlike our smoothie, the components in a heterogeneous mixture are not uniformly distributed. They're like a band, where each member plays their own instrument and contributes to the overall melody, but they're still distinct and separate. So how does the particle theory fit into all this? Well, the particle theory of matter states that all matter consists of many very small particles which are constantly moving or in constant state of motion. In a homogeneous mixture, these particles are uniformly distributed and move together, 
while in a heterogeneous mixture, the particles are not uniformly distributed and can move independently of each other. This means you can separate the raisins from the trail mix. But good luck trying to pick out the strawberries from your smoothie. That's the beauty of understanding homogeneous and heterogeneous mixtures. So, the next time you're munching on trail mix or savoring a smoothie, remember you're not just having a snack, you're experiencing science in action. Just like music genres, mixtures too can be homogeneous or heterogeneous, each with its unique composition. Did you ever wonder why sugar dissolves in water but oil doesn't? Let's find out. Solubility is like a party invitation. Some substances get the invite to mingle with water while others get left out in the cold. Factors like temperature, pressure, and the type of solvent all play a role in who gets to join the party. Take sugar and water for example. The sugar molecules are attracted to the water molecules so they dissolve readily. It's like they're all best friends at the party. But oil and water? Not so much. The oil molecules aren't attracted to the water molecules, so they don't mix. It's like they're at the same party but they just don't want to hang out together. Now let's talk about saturated and unsaturated solutions. A saturated solution is like a party that's at full capacity. No more guests can be squeezed in, it's as concentrated as it can be. On the other hand, an unsaturated solution is a party that's still got room for more guests. You can keep adding salute until it can't dissolve anymore and that's when it becomes saturated. But how do we measure this party capacity? That's where concentration comes in. Concentration is like counting the number of guests at the party. In qualitative terms, concentration is a measure of how much of a given substance is mixed with another substance. In quantitative terms, it's typically expressed as the amount of solute per volume of solvent. So, you could say a solution is concentrated, if it's like a packed party, with lots of solute in the solvent. A dilute solution, on the other hand, is like a party that's just getting started, with more room for solute in the solvent. Remember, the next time you make lemonade, you're practicing science by adjusting concentration and solubility. So, keep stirring that sugar, and let the water molecules invite them to the party. And who knows, maybe your next party will be a hit, just like a well-mixed solution. Water is not just for drinking or swimming, it's also known as the universal solvent, but why? Well, this isn't just a fancy title, it's because water has some unique properties that make it excellent at dissolving stuff. Let's get into the science of it. Water molecules are polar, meaning they have a positive and a negative end, like a tiny magnet. When a substance is added to water, these polar water molecules can surround and break apart the particles of that substance. This process is what we call dissolving. Because of its polarity, water can dissolve a wide range of substances, from salts to sugars, acids to bases, and even gases like oxygen and carbon dioxide. That's why we can find so many different substances dissolved in the oceans, lakes, and even in our bodies. So next time you drink a glass of water, remember, you're sipping on the universal solvent. Ever wished you could separate the raisins from your cereal? Well, science has a way. Let's dive into the fascinating world of separating mixtures. Imagine you're at a party and someone hands you a bowl of mixed nuts, but you only want the cashews. You could pick them out one by one, right? That's essentially what we call hand-picking, a rudimentary but effective method of separating mixtures. But what if our mixtures get a bit more complicated? Say a mixture of sand and water. You can't exactly pick out the sand grains, can you? For this we turn to a process called sedimentation and decantation. The sand being heavier will settle at the bottom, and then we can carefully pour out the water. In some cases we might need to use filtration, like when we want to separate coffee grounds from our morning brew. The filter paper allows the liquid to pass through, while the solid particles are trapped. Then there's evaporation, a method we use when we want to keep the dissolved substance like, when turning seawater into salt. The water evaporates when heated, leaving the salt behind. And for those of you thinking about that bowl of mixed nuts again, sieving could be your best friend. Different components of a mixture can be separated based on their size through a sieve or a similar tool. In more complex scenarios we might use distillation a process that separates substances based on their different boiling points or centrifugation, which separates components based on their densities. These methods aren't just for the kitchen or parties though, they have real-world applications in industries like pharmaceuticals where filtration and distillation are used extensively, or in water treatment plants, where sedimentation and decantation help provide clean water. Even from our bodies centrifugation happens when the blood is spun in a centrifuge to separate its components for testing. 
So next time you're staring down a bowl of cereal wishing the raisins would magically disappear, remember. With science, you might just be able to have your cereal and eat it without the raisins too. Pure substances are not just your average Joe, they're either elements or compounds, let's explore. Imagine a world where everything is unique and cannot be broken down into simpler forms. Welcome to the realm of elements. They're the building blocks of everything around us, the basic form of matter. Each element is made up of a single type of atom. Like pure substances, think of them as solo artists in the music world. They're like Beyonce, they don't need anyone else to make a hit. But sometimes these solo artists come together to form a band, and that's when we get compounds. Compounds are pure substances that consist of two or more different types of atoms bonded together. It's like when Paul McCartney and John Lennon teamed up to create the Beatles. Just like the Beatles, compounds have properties that are different from the elements that make them up. For example, water is a compound made up of hydrogen and oxygen. But you wouldn't be able to breathe underwater, would you? That's because the properties of water are different from those of oxygen and hydrogen. The beauty of compounds is that they always contain the same proportion of elements. For instance, water will always consist of two parts hydrogen and one part oxygen. It's like a recipe, always the same ingredients in the same proportions, no matter where you are or when you make it. And remember, while elements are like solo artists and compounds are like bands, they're not necessarily stuck in their roles. Compounds can be broken down into their constituent elements through chemical reactions. It's like when a band breaks up and the members go on to have successful solo careers. So, whether it's the simplicity of elements or the complexity of compounds, both play an essential role in the world of matter. They are the rock stars of the particle world, making up everything we see, touch, smell, taste and feel. So, pure substances are either the solo artists, elements or the supergroups, compounds of the particle world. Wow, we've covered a lot of ground. Let's do a quick recap. We started our journey with the particle theory of matter, exploring how everything around us from the air we breathe to the chair you're sitting on is made up of tiny particles. We saw how these particles are always moving, bumping and jostling against each other and how the speed of their movement depends on the temperature of the substance. We then delved into the world of pure substances and mixtures, distinguishing between the two. Remember, a pure substance contains only one kind of particle, while a mixture has more than one. To help us understand this better, we visualized a party. A pure substance is like a party with only one type of guest, say, all magicians, while a mixture is a party with a variety of guests, from magicians to musicians to comedians. Then we looked at homogeneous and heterogeneous mixtures. In our party analogy, a homogeneous mixture is like a well-mixed party where magicians, musicians and comedians are all mingling together. A heterogeneous mixture, on the other hand, is like a party where each group of guests sticks to their own kind. Next, we explored solubility and concentration. We discussed how factors like temperature and pressure affect the solubility of a substance and the rate at which it dissolves. We compared this to a dance floor. The more energetic the dance floor, higher temperature, the more people, particles, it can accommodate. We also touched on why water is referred to as the universal solvent. Remember, water is like the life of the party, able to mingle with almost all types of guests. We then discussed various processes used to separate mixtures into their components, from distillation to filtration, and identified applications of these processes in our daily lives. Finally, we described pure substances as elements and compounds which are like the individual guests and groups of guests at our party. And that's a wrap. Remember, understanding the world of particles can make your life a whole lot easier. Stay curious and keep exploring.